Hello everyone. Welcome to the webinar, The Harmonized Cognitive Assessment Protocol, a new HRS data resource developed and presented by the University of Michigan with funds from the NIA and hosted by GSA. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the GSA website and a notice to all attendees will be distributed once that recording is available. Um, a, Q, a question and answer session will immediately follow the live presentation and we will be accepting questions through the questions feature accessible on the GoToWebinar panel. Also located there um, is a downloadable handout for today. All right, let me see if I can get to the next slide. Perfect. Okay. The formal presentation will be given by our first speaker, Dr. Amanda Soniga, Associate Research Scientist in the Survey Research Center at the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan. And joining Amanda is the, uh, in the question and answer session will be Dr. Kenneth Lange, Professor of Internal Medicine at the Gerontology and Health Management and Policy, Research Investigator at the Ann Arbor VA HSRD, and Faculty Associate at the Institute for Social Research. And Dr. Lindsay Ryan, Associate Research Scientist in the Survey Research Center of the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan. So thank you, Amanda, Kenneth, and Lindsay for bringing us this important program. Well, thank you for joining us today for this deep dive into the Harmonized Cognitive Assessment Protocol, or HCAP. A previous webinar featured all sources of cognition data in the HRS. You can view the archived recording of this webinar on the HRS website under the documentation link on the home page. In the present webinar, we're going to focus on, in much more detail on one of these resources, HCAP. HCAP is thought of at HRS as the successor to the Aging Demographics and Memory Study, or ADAMS, and builds on that HRS data resource. Much of what we'll talk about today is also covered in a recently published paper by Langa et al. cited toward the end of this presentation. The main goals of the HCAP project are twofold, to create a new HRS data resource that will provide better data on cognitive impairment and dementia in the U.S. In combination with other HRS data, this will allow us to better identify current and future trends in the determinants prevalence, costs, and consequences of mild cognitive impairment, or MCI, and dementia in the U.S. HCAP is also designed to facilitate harmonization of cognitive measurement within HRS sister studies participating in the HCAP project. This will facilitate cross-national comparisons, again, of the determinants, prevalence, and impact of MCI and dementia. So as sometimes happens in HRS, we have slightly confusing nomenclature. Um, in this case, the title HCAP is used to refer to both the larger cross-national harmonization project and to the HRS portion of this larger project. We'll spend most of our time today talking about the HRS portion of HCAP, which again is an HRS data resource that we also refer to as HCAP. We'll also spend a bit of time explaining the harmonization effort and we'll point you to the sister studies data resources. So we're accomplishing the goals of HCAP by administering an expanded battery of cognitive tests and informant interviews to a random subsample of HRS respondents age 65 and older, and collaborating with research teams from the HRS International Family of Studies participating in HCAP to develop and implement similar cognitive testing protocols across these studies. I want to spend a few moments talking about what sets HCAP apart from other HRS cognition data resources. First, HCAP has more breadth and depth of cognition measurement than HRS core cognition measures. It has similar breadth and depth as ADAMS in terms of cognitive tests, but is much less costly to administer. The lower cost of HCAP means that we are able to more than triple the sample size relative to ADAMS. In short, HCAP combines the strengths of both sources of cognition data. In addition, HCAP is specifically designed for cross-national comparisons, as mentioned, through close consultation with several sister studies. It was also created in consultation with leading experts in dementia epidemiology in the U.S. and around the world. 
Now we'll turn to talking a bit about the HCAP study design. In the HRS, HCAPs, the HCAP sample was randomly selected from HRS panel respondents who are age 65 or older, that is, whose birth year was 1952 or earlier. Study entry at age 65 was chosen to increase the likelihood of detecting early stages of cognitive decline. Age 65 also marks the age of Medicare eligibility, allowing access to medical records for those who consent to linkage, which for the HCAP sam sample is about 90% of the sample. HCAP respondents had completed their 2016 core interview prior to eligibility for the HCAP. The selected respondent could have had a proxy HRS interview in 2016, but the HCAP interview itself did not use proxy respondents. To ensure representation of both single and coupled households, sampling included random selection of one half of all eligible single respondent households and random selection of one respondent from each eligible coupled household. Like the HRS face-to-face -face interviews, the HCAP respondent and informant interviews took place in the respondent's home and were administered by specially trained HRS interviewers. The interview design included a respondent interview <clears throat> that took approximately one hour and an informant interview that took about 20 minutes to complete. The respondent interview was a cognitive test battery and the CESD. There was an optional test of olfaction or sniff test at the end of the interview. An informant was one of up to three individuals nominated by the respondent. The informant interview included questions about the respondent's functioning and changes in abilities over the last 10 years. Ideally, the informant interview was completed in person immediately after completion of the HCAP respondent interview with the respondent located in another room. And we used a response booklet for this interview, for the informant interview, to accommodate the potentially sensitive nature of the informant's answers. So the field period was between June 2016 and October of 2017, and of 4,425 eligible cases, 3,496 completed the HCAP interview for final response rate of 79%. Now we'll turn to talking through the measures in HCAP. First, we'll begin by discussing some of the issues involved in selecting the tests and measures to be included. The key criteria for selection of the cognitive tests were that they covered a range of cognitive domains in order to provide valid research diagnoses of MCI and dementia, that they had substantial overlap with the initial Adams assessment in 2002 and 3 to facilitate comparisons to the earlier study, that they could be administered by trained survey interviews, interviewers in the home in about an hour, that they could be administered in comparable format by survey interviewers in other countries, including low-income countries, to promote harmonization that they had broad credibility and acceptance within the scientific community, and that they could be re-administered longitudinally to identify incident cognitive impairment and dementia. So any tests selected and included in HCAP needed to meet all of these criteria. To identify the component tests that best fit these criteria, we reviewed the content of several studies, including ADAMS, the Rush Religious Order Study, or ROSS, and Memory and Aging Project, or MAP, as well as several other community-based studies of cognitive impairment and dementia, including the 1066 dementia studies, the Indianapolis Ibadan Dementia Project, and the UK Medical Research Council Cognitive Function and Aging Study. The core elements common to nearly all of these prior studies were the mini mental state examination, the SERAD word list immediate and delayed recall, and semantic fluency or animal naming test. SERAD stands for the Consortium to Establish a Registry for Alzheimer's Disease. It's a neurocognitive test battery originally developed to identify early Alzheimer's disease, but it has become um, a widely used screening instrument for other types of dementia as well. To evaluate the contribution of these and other tests to diagnosis, we conducted statistical analyses of data from Adams and the Ross MAP studies with the assistance of David Bennett, who is the principal investigator of Ross MAP. 
After identifying common tests that covered a range of cognitive domains across Adams, Rossmap, and the other community-based studies noted above, we assessed the rates of missing data for these tests, and we prioritized tests with low rates of missing data. We then assessed the predictive power of the individual tests for identifying those diagnosed with dementia in the Adams and Rossmap studies using a multivariate ordered probit model. Tests with the greatest predictive power were selected and included in the final HCAP protocol. More details regarding the HCAP test selection process are available at the HRS website, which I'll show you in a bit. So the final tests administered by trained interviewers are listed on the next two slides in the order that they were given. The interview began with the mini mental state examination followed by the HRS version of the TICS, or the Telephone Interview for Cognitive Status, which has three items including object naming and naming the president. Five of the tests in the HCAP protocol came from the CERAD battery. HCAP also includes the semantic fluency or animal naming test and the letter cancellation test. The time backwards counting task comes from the Midlife in the United States study, or MIDAS. We use the four-item community screening instrument for dementia. In addition to the SARAD measures, um, there are several story-related tests, including story recall, immediate delayed, and recognition. We have the symbol digit modalities test, or SDMT. From the HRS, we have the number series test. And the last two cognitive tests are a subset of Raven standard progressive matrices and parts A and B of the trail making test. Given its impact on cognitive test performance, we also included an evaluation of depressive symptoms using the Center for Epidemiologic Studies Depression Scale, or CESD. And then as mentioned before, we included a smell test, which came from the National Social Life Health and Aging Project, or NSHAP. The informant questionnaire included the JORM informant questionnaire in cognitive decline in the elderly, or JORM IQ code, the Blessed Dementia Rating Scale, the 1066 Dementia Research Group Informant Questionnaire, the Community Screening Instrument for Dementia, or CSID, Cognitive Activities Questionnaire, and new HRS-developed activity questions, which include activities inside, for example, watching TV, reading, using a computer, and outside, such as driving, shopping, using public transportation. The informant interview also asked whether the respondents had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, stroke, Parkinson's disease, or memory problems. Okay, as I mentioned, several, but not all, of the HRS sister studies have fielded HCAP studies. These include ELSA in England, Halsey in South Africa, Lossy in India, MHAS in Mexico, and Charles in China. All of these HCAP studies have the MMSE, the HRS TICS, the SARAD word list learning and uh, learning and recall immediate and the semantic fluency test. Um, so some of these studies have additional uh, tests, but those are the tests that are common um, across all of the um, sister studies. So you'll know from previous HRS webinars about the Gateway to Global Aging Project, which works to make harmonized data available across the range of HRS sister studies. So if you go to the Gateway website, um, which I have the URL listed here, and go to the link to surveys, you'll see a tab for HCAP, and that will direct you to the studies that currently have data available. And I've listed the HCAP URLs for the studies that have them. So now we'll talk a bit about accessing the data. The data are referred to as HCAP 2016, and they are still in the first version of the early release, which became available in January 2019. As mentioned, the final sample size is 3,496 respondents, but most importantly, they are only available as a sensitive health data product, which means there's one extra step in accessing them. To gain access to the HCAP data, scroll to the bottom of the sensitive health data page for complete instructions. First, you create an account if you don't already have one, then complete the sensitive data use agreement 
and sensitive data order form and submit them through the online order system. You will be notified by email when access to download the files has been granted. So once you receive your um, notification, the pr approval notification, you log into the HRS Data Download System website and you'll see links to the HCAP data in the HRS Special Access Files box, files box which is on the right-hand side of the page. Note that if you also already have um, VDI access, you can fill out the sensitive data order form to have HCAP data added to your, um, to your VDI area. Now I just want to walk you through the HCAP documentation. There are a couple of user guides. The first one listed here provides more detail about the process of test selection that I mentioned earlier. The second one provides more depth on the study design and measures. And I urge you, as always, to read the data description since it contains important information on the file structure and using the data files. So don't skip it. Um, the last citation, uh, which is the paper I mentioned at the beginning, provides a good overall summary. And I believe that's, um, that's what you have attached. OK, lastly, we'll talk through a few things that are coming next. So it's no surprise in a study of cognition and dementia that missing data is prevalent, are prevalent. Of course, the data are not missing at random, which can be a problem. So to minimize the effect of missing data on your results, HRS imputes missing data to yield a more complete data set. So imputations for HCAP are underway and hopefully available soon. Um, and we'll, ad we'll administer a second wave, we're, we're trying to now, administer a second wave of respondent and informant HCAP data collection in conjunction with the 2020 wave of the HRS to all surviving members of the original HCAP sample and to a new age-in random sample of those aged 65 to 68 in 2020. This will provide new data to assess change in cognitive function including the incidence of new cognitive impairment and dementia. The identification of long-term longitudinal cognitive tra trajectories will also be possible from ongoing biennial cognitive testing within the HRS core interview. So lastly, um, the HCAP research group is currently developing a diagnostic algorithm that will use HCAP respondent and informant data to assign a research diagnosis of normal, MCI, or dementia for all HCAP respondents. The details of this algorithm and the diagnostic classifications will be published in a future paper and will be included in future releases of the HCAP data. So in other words, we're in the early release version of the HCAP 2016 um, the next, hopefully, at least maybe the next version will, will have this diagnostic classification. Um, as a successor to the ADAMS, the HCAP is not only less expensive, but its diagnostic approach is well suited to a population-based study due to a reproducible empirical algorithm de developed from HCAP data. This will allow diagnoses to be assigned in a reproducible and comparable way with data collected at different points in time and or in different countries. And this is going to help increase our cross-national comparability. While developing comparable and reproducible diagnostic classifications across all of the HCAP studies, especially for the intermediate state of MCI, presents fundamental measurement challenges, the use of modern psychometric measurement models can accommodate bias in cognitive assessment to diminish cultural and or language effects in cognitive testing. The use of psychometric measurement models will also allow for case ascertainment ratings to be made on a common metric of measurement and the identification of impairment thresholds that are equivalent in different samples. This will result in more fair international comparisons. Finally, coupled with the public release of all the raw scores from the cognitive tests and informant reports, researchers will also be able to develop their own diagnostic algorithms 
in addition to those developed by the HRS HCAP team. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Amanda. Um, so for everyone, just a reminder, uh, you can type and send questions using the questions feature in the dashboard, um, probably on the right hand side of your screen. Um, so please uh, be sure to use that feature as we are not using that raised hand feature today. So again, if you have a question, please use that questions panel. Um, another reminder, we are recording this session and we will send you a, an access link by email once that's available. Um, but in the meantime, for your um, web browser bookmarks, consider bookmarking um, geron.org slash webinar. Um, I'll also note that um, we have a webinar survey that will automatically launch after this program. So in an effort for continual improvement, we'd like to hear your thoughts. Um, please provide feedback by clicking that survey link at the end of the webinar. All right, I'll give everyone a second to um, locate that questions panel and send us a question. I think I see a couple coming in now. Great. Let's see. You can. Thanks for your patience as I'm adjusting my screen here. There we go. That's better. Um, I was, um, I Judy, I was just say to Ken and Lindsay to go ahead and un you can unmute now. Yeah, thanks. Yep. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Yes, here we are. Um, uh, many um, attendees thanking you for the webinar. Um, and let's start with this one. Um, what is the racial ethnic breakdown of HCAP participants? And I'll, um, if you don't mind, I'll just uh, complete the other parts um, and you can take them in any order. Um, so again, that first part was, what is the racial ethnic breakdown of HCAP participants? Can investigators request geographic locations for HCAP participants? And if so, at what level of granularity? Sure. Um, I could take that, um, and Lindsay can help me out if uh, sure. uh, if I need it. Um, first of all, thanks everyone for joining us, and thanks to Amanda for the the job of uh, doing the the presentation. The uh, in terms of the racial um, distribution, again, these um, HCAP was drawn from a random sample of folks who are were 65 and older in the HRS, and there's a, in that um, neuroepidemiology paper that Amanda noted, uh, there's a table that has all the, the characteristics of the sample, including race and ethnicity and uh, sex and education, et cetera. The um, HCAP sample is, oh, these are unweighted percentages, 11% or 383 people were Hispanic, um, 16 percent or 551 people were black, um, two, 71 percent uh, white, 2,483 um, uh, folks in the sample were white. And again, as Amanda mentioned, one of the one of the key reasons we wanted to do a larger sample was to to be able to support um, sub sub analyses and, and analyses of subgroups like uh, racial minorities. So that's with the larger, the significantly larger um, group of black and Hispanic respondents, we're hoping that that will uh, support that. And again, there, <clears throat> excuse me, there will be um, sample weights that will be um, available too to go along with the HCAP data so people can do um, weighted estimates of, uh, of of the Black and Hispanic population in, in the United States. And I'm sorry, the other parts of the question that I didn't answer. Was that 
uh, geographic oh, right. location. Right. So uh, geographic data will definitely be available to link with the HCAP data. Uh, the public release is just very large uh, geographic units, um, census mm -hmm. Uh, divisions, I think, uh, in order to get additional geographic data, um, you need to, or more fine-grained geographic data, you need to apply for um, restricted data access, which uh, people can do, and and how to do that is is available at the HRS website. Great, thank you. Um, where would I look to see what other measures are harmonized across the international sister HRS studies? So that uh, that will also be available. Uh, we've got a, let's see which table it is. Uh, we sort of have a, a spreadsheet within the um, that neuroepidemiology paper that can, is a good place to start. That's sort of table four in that, um, in that, uh, paper. Uh, and then also, um, Amanda can correct me if I'm wrong, I think we've also linked to the other HCAP studies in other countries at the HRS website. Um, and then also the um, uh, Gateway to Global Aging website will also have that information. That's right. That's correct. Great. All right, um, here's another one. If uh, I needed the demographic characteristics about the um, elderly, can I link HCAP to HRS? Yes, absolutely. That is a, a sort of a main, a main uh, goal and uh, uh, purpose of the HCAP is to have all of the additional uh, data from the HRS, both before and after we did uh, HCAP. So absolutely, uh, the HCAP is, um, all of the people in HCAP are a subsample of the HRS and all of their uh, other HRS data can be easily uh, linked in with the HCAP information. Again, it's, you know, um, uh, everybody in any of this HCAP um, you can think of is just another HRS uh, sub-study, you know, like CAMS or, um, or any of those sub-studies. And so in the data file you have, you'll have HHIDPN, and uh, that will be the way that you will um, connect these HCAP data to the HRS core data through using HHIDPN. Okay, um, here we are. This isn't specific to what was presented today, but I was wondering if there is a preferred name for the old 35 point cognitive measure in the HRS. Hmm. Uh, that's a good question. A preferred name for our core 35 point scale. Again, uh, Lindsay can correct me. Um, we, uh, I, I typically call it the HRS uh, cognitive scale. Um, it's it's composed of uh, various pieces, including uh, pieces from the telephone interview for cognitive status, which um, uh, has been used in many other studies. So uh, I don't know, Lindsay, do you have other advice on that front? Um, I've often heard it called the the total cognition score. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's sort of tricky because it goes across a lot of different cognitive domains so right. you can't just call it memory or speed you know that sort of thing but but what i what i often see it called and maybe rand calls it total cognition as well but mm -hmm. um i don't know that i would say there's one preferred way to label that yeah. um, but i i think you could do worse than to call it the total cognition score um you know which in sort of implies now the, I think the, the bigger question would be what to refer to as the, the 27 item, um, you know, right. and yeah, that's a little bit trickier. That That's a subset of items that uh, that have no age restriction. Yeah, the, that's the 30, total cognition for the under 65. <laughs> right, right, yeah. right. Yep. 
nomenclature is always our problem, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and really what that, what the 27.1 misses are the, the more sort of cognitive status questions. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here's another. Um, how is the current situation affecting data collection and uh, continuity of the studies in the U.S. and other sister studies? Yes. Wow. Well, that is a great uh, question, as as you might imagine, and I'm sure all of you that are involved in studies have been working on this the last couple of weeks. I would say. Um, it will, I mean, this is obvious, it'll, it'll certainly affect uh, our data collection. The key issues for HCAP um, is that it's um, a face-to-face -face interview, and we obviously are not able to do face-to-face -face interviews um, because of the COVID uh, situation. And again, like everyone else, um, you know, still waiting to see how how things play out and when we're, we are able to get back in the field um, to do those face-to-face uh, -face interviews. In terms of the the main HRS study, which um, in the, the 2020 field period just started uh, a few weeks ago, so we are again sort of monitoring things. Uh, we'll likely uh, need to uh, switch the about 50% of the HRS interviews in each wave are, are done face-to-face. -face. We'll likely be switching some or possibly all of those to telephone um, to a telephone study uh, or telephone mode uh, for this wave. Um, and uh, again, the HCAP um, field period that will was scheduled to start in sort of late June, early July this year uh, may, well, will likely have to be delayed because we wait until people get their HRS interview before, um, before we en enter them into HCAP. So, um, it certainly will affect our, our timing. We're obviously working hard to, to try to figure out strategies for trying to have as, as small an impact as possible, but uh, obviously we'll, we'll need to, to wait and see. I think in the, in our, among our international partners, um, uh, again, as far as I know, all, all research, face-to-face uh, -face research has been shut down in, in, in the other countries that we uh, collaborate with. Um, many of the other countries don't have a telephone option or telephone mode as part of their study, so so may be impacted even more than we are. So again, to be determined uh, over the next weeks to months. Okay, thank you. Um... Do you happen to know the proportion of the HCAP respondents who have completed the leave behind questionnaire? Is it good? Do you know that, Lindsay? I'm not sure of that. Uh, I don't know the exact number. It should be just a little less than half in theory because it was a random selection. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know, but it, it should be just under 50% um, is my best guess. And that's because um, it, it would be less than 50, fewer than, or less than 50% because um, again, to the, to the question, uh, the, the HCAP is selecting people who are 65 and older, whereas the leave behind went to the entire sample. Um, okay but it should be uh, a random half of the sample of people age 65 and older should also have the leave behind. Right. Does that sound right? Yeah. Yeah. From, from that same wave is what you mean, right? From the 2016. Correct. Yeah. Yep. The yeah. You could do a back of the envelope by seeing, you know, just doing the numbers it's it's not going to be a ton because you know 34 96 little, yeah be a little bit less than half of that mm -hmm. great okay um could you please talk about the requirements 
um, to be able to access the sensitive data? Can I access it as an academic if I don't have funding for my research? Or do I have to go to the University of Michigan to, to access? Yeah, no, you access to the sensitive data um, is not upon your having funding at all. It's literally just this um, extra step in signing the, um, the the data use agreement that basically just says you're you know you're you're not gonna um, that you're gonna kind of take extra care of these data because they contain more sensitive information and then also um, it's a data order form and and both of those are now online forms you don't have to fill out a paper copy you fill, fill them out on the online form on the website um, you know everything is moving a little slower these days but uh, but usually within a few days, you get an email saying you now have access, and then you just go, if you're registered, go to the data download area, and um, and once you're granted access, now you'll see on the right-hand side of the data download window, you'll see those HCAP files. So that's it. Anybody can get them. Anybody who can register for the HRS public data can also get sensitive data with just this extra step. Oh, good, okay. Um, for the slide listing available in sister studies, there um, wasn't a link for the Charles um, China. Does um, right. Charles have this research already or is it still on the way? They. I'm, I'll let you say, I, 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 there were two studies that, that don't have um, a link on their website that specifically addresses HCAP, but it doesn't mean they don't have HCAP data. Let me let uh, Lindsay and Ken, though, speak to uh, the availability of data. Yeah, so I do believe that Charles um, has already released uh, their HCAP data. I should say that Charles is uh, the one country that has sort of methodologically their HCAP data collection is sort of most different than the other studies in that um, they've, uh, they sort of did a sub-study um, both with some, some people already in Charles and, and then also um, recruited people outside of Charles from a, a number of the um, uh, hospitals and healthcare systems uh, in China. And they've, um, they sort of, uh, did a validation study of some of the HCAP measures with the goal of finding those measures that uh, they thought were most useful for um, making the, the kind of diagnostic uh, classifications. And then their plan is to include sort of a, a, a subset of the HCAP measures within their, actually their core, um, their core data collection. So, and again, and I'm not sure, Lindsay, if you know this, but I, I believe they've already released their initial HCAP data along with their most recent core measures, uh, but I'm not 100% certain of that. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure either, but I, I thought they had, um, but I haven't checked. Definitely the, um, uh, I mean, you, you certainly should feel free to email the, um, the principal investigator of Charles, you know, or there if they have some kind of help desk, but, but I think your first stop uh, for finding about out about data availability in the sister studies um, would be the the gateway to global aging, and I know they they definitely do have a help desk. Um, so check out that website, and uh, they are extremely knowledgeable um, about th those data. Okay, thank you. Um, is there a form for accounting um, educational differences in each of the international sister studies and or cohorts? Um, so example, um, uh, some sort of weight for educational differences among countries. Uh, great question and uh, folks on the webinar are likely uh, familiar with the yeah the key complexity and issue around um, education and uh, both in terms of cognitive performance but also cognitive testing. So um, 
if I'm understanding the question correctly, their sort of data on educational attainment will be, of, you know, associated and available with each um, each of the studies. So you'll know uh, for each respondent uh, who is in the HCAP study what their educational attainment was. The more complex question of of how you incorporate uh, or adjust for education in the interpretation of of cognitive testing, uh, I, I would say uh, we're we're working on that uh, as part of our our diagnostic assessment in the HRS HCAP, and I think all of the other studies will also. Uh, we're hoping that there'll be um, uh, you know sort of some uh, collaboration and and comparability in terms of how education is handled across the various studies but again i think that will be one of the that will be one of these complexities where um, you know individual researchers may want to do things a bit differently and, and frankly different the different countries may want to do do things a bit differently because of the you know very different levels of education for instance in uh, say india compared to the united states or 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 some of the European countries. So that was a long-winded way to say that we're definitely uh, sort of focused on that and there will be definite um, sort of scientific efforts to um, to have comparable ways of dealing with educational attainment across the studies. Um, but again, there'll, there'll be the ability for individual users to, to, to adjust for education or not adjust for education in, in, in the ways that they think is best. And then the only thing I, I would add to that, Ken, is that mm -hmm. comparing education levels across countries just on its own is very complicated and confusing, right. at least right. to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would direct people to the gateway to global aging because they already have recommendations on at least how to make education status um, right. more comparable from country to country just as a first step. Yep. Yeah, great point, Lindsay. All right. Um, so a couple questions around the data. Um, uh, one part being, uh, what's the expected release date or time frame for version two? And um, the other part, sort of uh, around, will raw um, non-imputed data be released? Lindsay, do you want to address the the sort of raw imputed data and some of the some of the licensing issues uh, uh, in terms of yeah. data use. So, I mean, in, in a way, the the raw data is already released. Mm -hmm. um, we can't give detail about many of the many of the tests with an HCAP are copyrighted, and so we are not allowed to publish specific item level information about those assessments. Um, so, you know, we've had many questions come into HRS about, you know, which of the MMSE items are this or that, and we we're, we can't give that information. Um, so, you know, right now, I don't think, okay, so <laughs> there's one, actually, I don't, I don't think there's, is there any imputed data in the version that's released right now? I, I don't think so yet. I don't think so. I, I think those are on the way. Um, there, we have one example within our data where we truly have missing at random because there was a mail truck fire, and so some of the hard copy materials um, <laughs> went up in flames, as far as we can tell. So you know, those, uh, and we have indicators for you know why the data are missing where wherever possible. Um, but in, in, a, in, in essence, the, the item level raw data is already available. We just can't give detail um, for some of the, what, what those items, where those items are actually coming from because of copyright restrictions, um, if, if that's what the, the question was hoping to get at. Um, but imputations, yeah, other imputations are on the way right. um, for people that want to use imputations. Yeah, and my gut is that the imputation, um, uh, additional imputation data will be out relatively soon. The the HRS approved or the HRS derived uh, diagnostic algorithm we're still working on. I think that's at least a few months away. Uh, Rich Jones, who's a psychometrician at uh, Brown and Jen Manley who at uh, Columbia are, are on our HRS HCAP um, uh, 
uh, team and are kind of leading the way on some of that um, some of that data analysis and diagnostic algorithm. But uh, again, we're hoping to have something on that front uh, in the next few months or so. But again, we'd, we'd encourage people to dive into the data and uh, use their uh, favorite ways of, uh, of developing, whether it's cut points on specific scales or, or other methods for, uh, for coming up with their, their, um, their own um, you know, way to, uh, to do these diagnostic classifications. And, uh, uh, and then we'll be developing the, the HRS, uh, the HRS group will be developing a, an algorithm uh, again, hopefully in the next few months. And then the other question was about when the second wave will be released. Is that right? Or I think it was version two of the data. Oh, version two. Okay, so not yeah. wave two. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, what is the expected release date or time frame for version two? Gotcha. Yeah, and that would be the again relatively soon for the imputations, a little bit longer for the uh, our final diagnostic algorithm. I would say. Um, can you hear me? It looks like I got disconnected from the webinar. This is Amanda. Yes, I can hear you, Amanda. Good. Good. Um, I think I think what the the participant might be referring to is the follow up wave, and yeah. if if that if that is what they're um, referring to, um, realize that again, uh, all of our field period for the 2020 wave of core data collection is on hold, and recruitment to that follow up wave for HCAP. Um, is is delayed as well because we will be we again it's going to be the same protocol where we'll be selecting HCAP um, or the the HCAP respondents will be the people who are uh, you know still alive from HCAP 2016, but that new age in cohort will come from people who have completed their 2020 HRS core interview. Um, so. I, I'm going to do a back of the envelope and you guys can check me on this, but we won't be out of the field with 2020, probably at least until summer of 2021. Yeah. Um, you know, HCAP then would have another field period of another, you know, period of months beyond that. And then there's usually another um, uh, four to four months or so to six months of, of data processing before the data are available. So what does that bring us up to? Sometime in, sometime probably in 2022 is when um, the follow-up wave of HCAP data would be public. Right. Does that sound yeah. right? Uh, yeah, just to cl uh, clarify the, you know, our, our before the COVID uh, um, COVID descended on us all. Uh, the the plan was for the HCAP field period to go from sort of summer 2020 through the end of the year uh, 2020, or a bit into 2021, and then right the um, processing the data and uh, uh, would would happen after that, as Amanda said, six months or so. But so that would have put us, you know, sort of late 2021, I would say. Um, but that will almost certainly be delayed because of the, the COVID issues. Right. Yeah. So, so well into well into 2022 is the, yeah. the most likely. Right. So if you're writing a grant proposal, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's when you can expect the data to be available. I don't know if that was the question, but it'll maybe answer somebody else who had that question. There you go. Yeah. Um, all right. A question about um, defining dementia. Um, now that there isn't a, a diagnostic algorithm for dementia available, what is your suggestion for defining dementia? Is the MMSE a good measure? Well, great question. Um, I think, again, um, you know, 
uh, a lot of this is always, or a lot of these kinds of decisions are always, uh, uh, will you be trying to making, make comparisons to other studies that, uh, or other sa similar samples or, or studies that have, um, have defined it that way? I, I think um, MMSC is, again, as I'm sure many folks on the webinar know, uh, you know, perhaps the most widely used and, and longest used sort of general cognitive screening scale. So uh, I think that would be a reasonable start to uh, uh, to do that. Um, others have, you know, you might uh, think about putting, uh, combining a number of scales or, or um, together to think, uh, to, to do that, uh, you know, to, to make a larger uh, scale that perhaps covers um, other cognitive domains in more depth. Um, so I think, again, it, it would be, uh, I'd recommend, you know, making that decision based on the kinds of comparisons you want to make, um, what other studies have used, and uh, and to go from there. I know, Lindsay, you have other recommendations along those lines. Yeah, I mean, MMSE, at least with using that, um, there's lots of other studies you can compare to that that use just that that one test. But right. I think any of those approaches are are sort of reasonable um, until the logarithm is is valuable. All right. Would you, would you guys? Let me. I was going to say. I'll just jump in, it's Amanda. Um, I I don't know it off the top of my head, but. Um, you would it would it ever make sense to apply the same logic that um, the Langa Weir classifications have used? Um, I don't know if we I don't do we have all of the same data in HCAP you, that were used for those, or I don't uh, think we do. It, not specifically in the HCAP data collection, but um, right. Yeah, so we've um, a number of a number of uh, research groups, including ours, have have used um, the core HRS cognition measures as well as some some measures of other function like ADLs and IEDLs, um, right, to, to try to derive a sort of um, classification scheme using the core data um, based on the ADAMS, the prior ADAMS uh, data collection. So to try to sort of validate or, or develop either cut points or, um, or regressions that create probability assessments for each individual. So that, using the core data, that would certainly be possible um, to do for the people in HCAP. And uh, again, eventually we and others, I think will wanna be doing that sort of comparing how the HCAP uh, performance on the HCAP tests compares to the uh, core H HRS core measures of, of cognition. Uh, so that's that would certainly be a possibility to uh, to do, Amanda. All right. All right. Um, I think this might be our last question for the hour. Back to data. Um, would you recommend using unweighted data currently available for research or waiting until weights are available? Another good question. Um, I would say, um, and again, there I would there are different uh, sort of philosophies around uh, weights in various um, academic disciplines, but I would say in general, if if you're wanting to make um, inferences about sort of proportions of the population, that that would be something that uh, you'd want to be um, you'd want to be waiting for the weights for. Uh, if your research questions are more about um, you know how do either individual demographic measures or, or other kinds of, you know, looking for relationships of uh, um, of various characteristics of respondents to um, how that's related to cognition. I think uh, unweighted data would typically be seen as, as fine. Um, so again, to me, um, in my research, uh, again, if you're wanting to make uh, an inference or an estimation of the prevalence of dementia in the population, for instance, then I think weights are pretty necessary. But uh, um, for those other kinds of research questions, um, I think the unweighted data would be fine. Again, I don't know if Amanda or Lindsay want to weigh in on that issue. 
completely agree. Yeah. Yeah, I agree as well. That's that's uh that's that's generally what we what we what we would teach in the in the uh, the main HRS course is uh, good guidance for using the weights. Okay, and uh, if if all right, let's just tag on um, a follow on question on this topic. Um, when we merge HCAP with HRS, can we use the sampling weights in HRS for analysis? Uh, a great question. I I, I think uh, yes would be my. Um, answer there will be uh, again i think um weights are being developed specifically for the hcap sample that are actually both for the larger hrs sample in um 2016 as well as for the hcap sample but i, I would say as a first as a first um rule using the the general hrs sampling weight would be uh would be fine I, I can hear um, Ryan McCammon, um, you know, any, who you know, about that. You, well, no, no, yeah. no. I can hear saying um, you could do worse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I agree. I, I think um, starting with the HRS weight makes a lot of sense. There may be some adjustments uh, as the weights are the final weights for uh, the the 2016 and the and the HCAP sample are. Are finalized, but I think that would. Um, I agree with R Ryan on that. You could do worse. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, Amanda, Kenneth, and Lindsay. Um, it's been a real pleasure learning about HRS's new data resource. Um, Want to thank everyone for participating today, and this is the end of the program. Right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.